Okay, right, so look at our third session, the remnant of Israel future. And let's just start with the verse, we referred to this earlier actually, it's time of Jacob's trouble, and here it is, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So remember back to our second session of the remnant of Israel today, which we also didn't have time to elaborate, but deletion 6.16, realistically, it means that the remnant of Israel is also called the Israel of God, which makes sense if you think about it. Believing Jewish people today. And of course, that is a remnant, uh, there's a minority, minority of the whole nation. Believers in the Messiahship of Yeshua, Jesus. Also being part of the bride or the body of Messiah. Now, the fact of that remnant, remember, which is present, chosen by grace, was what also provides the basis both for the continued existence of Israel but also the basis for all believers uh, being able to trust that what God says he will do, which is good, good news. God is a promise-keeping God. So in this final session, we're going to look at the remnant of Israel prophetically as in the future. And so in this context, what we're focusing on is, on is what's going to happen following the gathering of the bride of Messiah, what Jesus spoke of in John 14 which will be obviously following that will be specifically a period of time as just reference, the time of Jacob's trouble. Seven year period, according to Daniel chapter nine, verse 27, also called the day of Jehovah or the day of the Lord God in, in the Old Testament or the tribulation as well. In the name of God. We're just going to look at the faithful remnant of Israel during this time of tribulation. Now to get a definition, of what we mean by the faithful remnant in this particular context, we need to point out that there are actually a number of different groups within Israel. There are four, we can, at least four different distinct groups we can sort of categorize during this time period. So the first one up there, sorry, was apostate Jews. This is the first group. So if you're thinking in this context, we're talking about the, the, the time of Jacob's trouble. There's a group within this time period who would be the meaning of Daniel chapter 9, 27. These are the ones who enter into the covenant with the Antichrist, also described in Isaiah as a covenant with Sheol and death, which begins this period of time of tribulation. And so according to Zechariah 13, they're going to comprise about two-thirds of the nation who will die in unbelief during the worldwide persecution that occurs during this time period especially in the second half, where, as I mentioned earlier in answer to a question, Satan is going to be focused on destroying the nation of Israel with the purpose of preventing the second coming of Messiah. Because Revelation chapter 12 explains that when Satan is cast out of heaven around this time, he knows his time is short. And he knows from Scripture exactly how long that time is. It's three and a half years, time, time, and half a time, which is also three and a half years, or 42 months. It's actually described also as 1,260 days. So there's about four different ways it's described. They all add up to three and a half years. In the same time period, we then have the 144,000 Jewish people mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. These are part of the one third of the nation who will survive the tribulation period. They are described in Revelation 14 as male virgins. They are Jewish, obviously, out of the 12 different tribes. And what we see is that God specifically states that they are to be sealed before any of the uh, uh, the seal judgments come. Chapter 6, there are various seal judgments. Before that happens in chapter 7, God tells the angel to seal them with the seal of God to protect them from these coming judgments. That's why they're able to go out into the world and bring the gospel because they're protected by God. We see the outcome of their evangelizing in the second half, the later half of chapter seven, where it talks about a vast multitude, and we're told specifically that they come out of the great tribulation. 
So these are the group that are going to be evangelizing the world. Well, you might be surprised to learn that one of the purposes of the tribulation is to bring a worldwide revival. That's what God's about. No, he's not willing that any should perish. But he's also going to have a plan, as we're going to see, for the nation of Israel as well. So in that third group, we have other Jewish believers. These will be ones that receive the gospel, maybe through the 144,000, possibly the two witnesses of Revelation 11 who are based in the city of Jerusalem, or possibly other means. They're not part of the 144,000. And because the statement in Revelation 7-9 says every nation, that would imply that some of the nation of Israel who are believers would also become martyrs in the first half, being part of the saints who are persecuted, part of the fifth seal saints of Revelation chapter 6. And so they would then be resurrected along with the rest of the deceased tribulation saints following the second coming of Messiah in the 75-day interval, which is spoken of in Daniel chapter 12, and therefore enter the kingdom, having died and been resurrected, in a glorified state. Revelation 20, verse 4. But those believers who don't die during the seven years, who survive throughout of Israel, or who are part of the one third who survive, they will enter the kingdom in a mortal state because they haven't died and they haven't been resurrected. So you have people who are God who die resurrected to an immortal state, people who stay alive who will enter the kingdom in a mortal state. Then we have faithful remnant. This is the group we're going to be focusing. So these are pretty much the or comprise the majority, if not all, of the one-third of the nation who survived the tribulation. And interestingly, throughout the entire time we look at the uh, prophecies in the Tanakh and the Old Testament, what we see is that through the entire time of the tribulation, almost right till the last few days, they are actually unbelievers in Yeshua as Messiah. And so they're described by the prophet Isaiah as the ones who will not be in haste. I suppose seven years <laughs> to make up your mind virtually is not being in haste, isn't it? I'm glad I don't, I don't do that one for my kids. I don't think they'd be too happy with me. But this is the reality. It's, it's a, Isaiah 28, 16, Isaiah 28, 16, they're going to be the ones who are also the unbelievers as far as Antichrist is concerned. So they are the non-many as opposed to the many of Daniel 9.27. So this means that they will refuse to have anything to do with this covenant that's signed. Also, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 to 30 speaks about this remnant. And uh, verse 20 says the following. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. And so they don't rest on the one who strikes the nation. That's, that's Antichrist. Instead, they trust in God. But as I said, at this point, they haven't necessarily, in the early part of the tribulation, put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. So if they're unbelievers for the best part of the tribulation, in what way would we use the term faithful? Well, they're faithful that they are remaining loyal to the God of Israel as they understand him at that point. They live up to the light that they have, and therefore eventually they become believers in Messiah. And according to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, that happens in the last three days of the tribulation. So now let's look at the tribulation, the fact of that within the, uh, sorry, the remnant within the tribulation. So here's Isaiah chapter 10 again, uh, verses 20 to 23. It says, in that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on whom struck them, but lean on the Lord, the, the Holy One of Israel and truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Although your people Israel be as a sand of the sea, only a remnant will return. Destruction is decreed, overflow with righteousness for the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of all the earth. 
So a key point of this passage is that the remnant of Israel will survive. Verse 20, as I said, unlike the rest of Israel, these ones lean on the Holy One of Israel and do not lean on or rely on it. Verse 21, it promises that this group will ultimately return to the God of Israel. Yes, it might take time, but it's going to happen. And the point of 21, 22 verse A is that in spite of the numerical strength of Israel, in the context of the beginning of the tribulation, when we get to the end, only a remnant will return to God. This is uh, Zechariah 13 speaks about this. And also in verses 22b to 23, he talks about the destruction of the whole earth that's going to occur within this period of the tribulation. And Isaiah 28, 22 reveals that's because of this covenant that is signed between the Antichrist and the unbelieving leadership of Israel. But despite that, a remnant is going to survive. The promise is that this remnant is going to survive despite all of this, these other disobedient acts that are occurring. God still is going to bring out of this time a group which is referred to in Scripture as survivors or the escaped of the house of Israel. We actually see that in the passage we just read, which referred to the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob. Sorry about the weird looking display there. Let's bathe again. All right, so in light of what we've seen, Given that all the revelation reveals to us what's happening within the tribulation period and the fact that Satan is trying to destroy the nation of Israel, a rightful question to ask is, well, how do they escape? How is it possible? Well, Scripture actually reveals promises concerning this group that are given. And the first one relates to the promise of the protection of the remnant. Protection of the remnant. God promises to protect and preserve this faithful remnant during Satan's campaign to destroy the Jewish people within that time period, and especially in the second part of the tribulation. So it's an important promise. It says the end, verse 41, verse 4 of Isaiah, Fear not, you worm of Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. But alongside this protection, which is obviously very important, there is also provision. Why is that important? Well, the importance of the provision for the remnant is within the context of the abomination of desolation, which Jesus also refers to in Matthew, is that following this point, anyone without the mark is forbidden to buy, sell, or have any ability to earn money or to buy any goods. So given that, how would you eat? How would you get money to eat or have something to be able to buy without the mark? Well, we're told in Isaiah that God's going to provide water and food for the remnant during this time of the tribulation. Isaiah chapter 41, Isaiah chapter 41, verses 17 to 18. So think back, the wilderness in Sinai. God provided food, water. Right? 40 years. So this isn't 40 years. So if God can do 40 years, he can most certainly do seven or three and a half, however you want to take account. Three and a half in terms of inviting away. Three and a half years isn't the problem. And he's promised that he's going to do that. And interestingly, that provision is part of what gets those who have yet to believe in Yeshua as Messiah to reconsider their relationship with God, to relook at him, re refreshed eyes. It's like, ah, huh, God is doing something here. They see it, they start to respond to it. And it says here that they may see and know and consider, uh, so may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. So it's starting to get their attention. It's starting to realize God is at work. So conversely, although the remnant is protected by God, the non-remnant 
fizzled and so they die. So remnant survive because of God's protection and provision, the non-remnant don't. But let's have a look at what, step back for a second and ask ourselves that question again. What do we see with the tribulation here, when we look at it, is that God's sovereign use, this is not a popular topic, what I had, God's sovereign use of suffering to bring salvation. Not a hot topic usually from the pulpit, but it's there. It's part of God's word. Now, for most of us here who have a love for the lost sheep, the house of Israel, we naturally loathe this idea of a future suffering of the nation of Israel. It's just not something we like any more than any of us would like to see anyone we love suffer. But it's also important that we don't avoid or to deny the truth because of that natural reaction, just because we don't like the idea. Because I'm reminded of a very important discussion that occurred between Yeshua and the Apostle Peter. I love the Apostle Peter. He's like me. He puts, he puts his mouth to put his foot in it. If he's doing really well, he puts his second foot on it and falls flat on his backside. I appreciate the fact that God saves people like that because I'm in that crowd. And when Jesus has just begun to share, just being able to, to tell his disciples, look, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things, including being killed. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. It's at this point that Peter, who naturally, because he loves Jesus and doesn't want to see him suffer, takes Jesus aside, you know, just for a moment, to have a little bit of a word with him, to rebuke him, saying, far be, from, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, that's a rather ironic statement, isn't it? Peter is calling him Lord, but rebuking him. The two don't match, do they, if you think about it? So what's Jesus' response to Peter's caring attitude towards him. Anyone know? Get behind me, Satan. Ouch. Wow, that seems a little harsh, don't you think? But it's not. Because Jesus explains the problem to him. He says, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. See, none of us, unless you're sadomasochistic, we won't go there, likes the thought of suffering. None of us are lining up to suffer. But God in his sovereignty uses suffering to bring salvation. It's been said, you have to, to, to have a resurrection, you first must have a crucifixion. And in Israel's case, according to God's word, must first be a tribulation before there is a national salvation. So when we get to the final days of the tribulation, what we see there is a spiritual breakthrough, promised, prophesied in Scripture in the nation of Israel. That's what Paul is referring to in Romans 11. So let's go back to that. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards the election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so now, too, they have been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to them, 
they may also now receive mercy. God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on them. So verses 25 to 26 in this particular passage actually refer to this national salvation, future national salvation that's going to be occurring. Notice that as a nation, they are, they are being hardened. That's a present tense reality, but only in part is a remnant and only temporarily. So the part, as I said, refers to the fact that there is a present age, uh, sorry, is during this present age a remnant of Israel who are coming to faith, who have come to faith. This context of the hardening is only temporary because it's until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Fullness means a fixed number of Gentiles, a fixed number, if you were, of wild olive branches to be grafted into the olive tree. Once that number is reached, that's the set number of Gentiles. This is actually confirmed by James in Acts 15, 14, when he states that the purposes of the age where the gospel is going out to the Gentile nations is for God to take from them a people for his name. Acts 15, 14. That process of taking a people from his, for his name from the nations continues until the fullness of the Gentiles is reached. Following that, all Israel will be saved. The salvation then refers specifically to that future generation of national Israel alive at this point in time when the following, when the fullness of the Gentiles is reached. It doesn't mean all Jews of all time, rather it's all Jews living at that time. He then provides evidence from this from the Tanakh. He quotes from Isaiah 59, 20 to 21, Isaiah 59, 20 to 21, and Isaiah 27, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 9, emphasising that there is to be a national salvation of Israel based on the new covenant. And then analyzes this truth. Firstly, regards the gospel, they are your enemies, for, they are enemies for your sake. What does he mean? Well, he means that the alienation of Israel, a partial hardening, given in light of the covenantal promises, is actually God's way of bringing Gentiles to himself. Secondly, as regards their national election, they are beloved for their fathers, the patriarchs' sake. These covenants include Israel's future national salvation. So on the one hand, they became enemies so we could get salvation, and so now we should want to bring them salvation. There's a sort of a there, there and back again sort of type thing. And he points out the, the reason this is true is because the gifts, the covenantal promises of the unconditional covenants and the national calling, the national election, are not to be repented of. God is not changing his mind about this. The promises he's made, he will keep. The nation he has elected stays chosen. That's not changing. And then... Verses 30 to 32, he presents the principle of God's mercy. He discloses with these four points. Firstly, in relation to God's mercy. Unbelief has given God a chance to show his mercy to the undeserving. It's me. Secondly, the Gentiles being uh, disobedient, I've done the funny disappearing thing. This can be a second. Can receive mercy. Okay, so because of unbelief, we now have a chance to receive mercy. I was disobedient. I needed mercy, therefore I can receive. Thirdly, now that Israel is disobedient because they rejected the Messiah on a national basis, Matthew twelve they qualify to receive God's mercy. Now, I have a chance to show mercy as a believer, to demonstrate God's mercy through sharing the gospel to all, both Jew and Gentile alike. So I've received mercy and now I can share or show mercy 
by how I treat others and want to show that God loves them. So, yeah. Next point that I just want to point out here is that some of you might pick up on what we would call an apparent contradiction. Those who are biblical scholars here might have realised that in Romans 11, 16, 26, sorry, he says that all Israel will be saved at all. That's those Jewish people at that specific time in the future that will be saved. However, Isaiah says, Isaiah chapter 10, speaking of the same time period, only a remnant of them will return. So which is it? Is it remnant of Israel or is it all Israel? Well, actually, again, the Bible gives us the answer. The Bible's quite good like that. If you look hard enough, you'll find the answers. Zechariah 13, 8 to 9. And the whole land declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I'll put this third into the fire and refine them as one requires refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. They will say, the Lord is my God. So what we see here is throughout the course of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, two-thirds of the Jewish population will perish. These will be mostly the non-remnant unbelievers, leaving only a remnant, one-third of the nation escaping, who are refined and saved. So only the remnant come of Israel come through the tribulation and survive physically. This is why we talked about earlier that they are the survivors or the escaped of Israel. There's a second message. Micah chapter 2, verse 12. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bosra. As a flock in the midst of their pastor, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. So it's important to understand that in this passage, we are looking at Hebrew poetry, and that's not based on rhyme or rhythm, as we would normally understand it, but on parallelism. Parallel points. So let's have a look at this. So we have line one, which then line two refers back to, and then line and repeats some four from line one. And we'd have the same line three, and then line four would refer back to line three. So, so looking up here, we look at the first two lines. So the second should refer back to the first. We see in line one, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. And yet in line two, it says, I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. So what's the point? The point of this couplet is that the all Israel and the remnant of Israel become one and the same by the end of the tribulation. We've, that's done by paralyzing, the par paralyzing, paralyzing par I can't even say it, putting in parallel these two concepts, all of the in line one, and the gathering of the remnant in line two. So this is saying, by using this form of poetry, he's saying these are one and the same thing. At this point, at the end of the tribulation, this means that the whole nation that survives is the remnant. That's who is left. It's the remnant. And because all those who survive, the remnant, become believers, therefore the whole nation that's left have come to faith. The whole remnant have come to faith. All Israel is saved. That's all that's left. The others have perished. So now all Israel and the remnant have become one and the same thing. So there isn't any contradiction. We don't have the contradiction between Paul and Isaiah because this is the reality. At the end of the seven years and the last three days, all Israel and the remnant of Israel become one and the same. So let's look at what happens following the tribulation when we look at the remnant within the context of the Messianic kingdom. So let's have a look at this. For this is the covenant, this is from Jeremiah 31, that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I'll put my law within them, I'll write it on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, and each his brother saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the 
least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I'll forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. So what does this passage show us? Show us. This shows that celebrate Messiah will be out of a job. Elevate. But also, since in the Messianic kingdom, the nation of Israel remain a saved nation, it means that all Israel will remain the faithful remnant throughout the kingdom. In other words, they're all now in that all Israel, all Israel of God. We haven't got a, an unbelieving component anymore, which is but a believing, faithful Israel. The new covenant promises the ongoing salvation of every single Jewish person throughout the entire period of the Messianic kingdom. What does that mean? It means that all Jewish people born during the Messianic kingdom will come to save in faith by age 100 or earlier. That's based on Isaiah 65, 20, the age limit. Isaiah 65, 20. In turn, this means that Israel remains the faithful remnant throughout the whole kingdom period. That's important because of what it means that anything that the Bible says about the nation of Israel during the kingdom is also true of the remnant because they're the same thing. Like saying one times one and one. Yeah. They've become the same thing. And we do have the remnant motif emphasized in certain prophetic passages which refer to the Messianic kingdom. And I'm just going to very briefly summarize these. They're probably already over time. I'm all right? Okay. The salvation of the remnant, first of all, in Micah chapter 4, verse 7, results in Israel being regathered into the land. We're just looking at what the prophets have to say in general about the remnant during the Messianic kingdom. Secondly, this final worldwide regathering of Israel into the land in relief is one and the same as the regathering of the remnant. And so the first point was the salvation of the remnant means that they're regathered. This regathering of Israel is also the regathering of the remnant. Thirdly, the sins of the remnant are going to be forgiven. And that forgiveness will remain in perpetuity throughout the Messianic kingdom. I thought you can see the verses up there. These are the various other Old Testament prophecies referring to this. Of course, we already saw this alert I talked about in Jeremiah 31 as well. So this is not very necessarily exhaustive, it's just an overview. Next, because the remnant will be sinless in the land, therefore they will live in security in the land. So one of the unconditional covenants given to the nation of Israel was the land covenant. And essentially what it meant was the land belongs to Israel but the blessings of the land are dependent on obedience. Okay? So if they wanted to be blessed, they had to be obedient. If they were disobedient, then they would miss out on those blessings. And eventually God said in this covenant, if you keep doing it, I'm going to exile you from the land. Okay? But conversely, he says, look, when you are obedient, you're going to be blessed in the land. Well, here they're obedient. So now they're going to receive all of the blessings of the land that God has promised because they qualify for those blessings because they're obedient. So hallelujah, they're going to benefit from the blessings of the land promises and so on that were given to them. And then the next point is that what this means is this faithful remnant is going to be the one that possesses all of the promised land. They are going to be the ones who get the full possession. That was promised to them, and especially to Abraham and others, uh, the land will be theirs. And then the next point that's made in the prophets is that God is going to use the remnant to spread the word of God amongst the Gentile nations during the Messianic kingdom period. So you can see that the remnant play a very pivotal role prophetically within the Messianic kingdom. They actually a very important generation. If you could so parallel, sort of contrast, black and white, so to speak. Matthew 12 is the low point in the sense of a generation rejecting Messiah. And here, this future generation accept Messiah. They are the high point. Okay. So in the last 
three sessions. We have looked at the remnant of Israel past, present and future. If you remember back in the first session, we looked at the fact that we have a Israel as a whole, then within that, the believing remnant of Israel. Israel of God, who believe in God and are saved and preserved by him. That concept, of course, was revealed firstly to Elijah and then to the writing prophets, especially Isaiah. In this age, scripture shows that it's all ethnic Jewish believers who come to faith in Messiah Jesus who are part of the remnant of Israel, the Israel of God. They're also part of the bride of Messiah. That the continued presence of this remnant chosen by grace is the basis both for the continued present, uh, existence of Israel, and it's also the basis on which all of us as believers can trust that what God says, he will do. Finally, regards the remnant of Israel in the future that was seen by the means of the time of Jacob's trouble, God will bring about a salvation of the remnant, which will also uh, see all Israel saved, because the remnant in Israel will be one of the same at that point. And so at this point, national Israel will not only enter into a state of faithfulness, they will then continue to be a faithful state. Join all the promises and all the blessings of the covenant, including the possession of the promised land. All of this will be made possible through the person and work of our Lord and Saviour and our Messiah, Yeshua. That's why Paul says of Jesus, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory.